John, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Where were you living at the time? Broadbrook, Connecticut. And you, you've lived here your whole life? Yes, I was born here. Can you tell me about your why you enlisted? Yes, because it was right after I was watching the news and the uh, battles of Wake Island and then Guadalcanal. And I felt like I would want to do my duty in the military. So on December 26, 1942, I went to Springfield, Massachusetts and signed the papers to become a Marine. Why did you choose the Marine Corps? <laughs> because they were tough and ready and hard and that's what I wanted to be. How old were you at the time? I was 19. Wow. After you signed up in Springfield, how long before you actually left for basic? Approximately two weeks. I believe it was January 19th, 1943, that uh, I went to Paris Island. After you uh, enlisted and left Broadbrook, Connecticut, where did you go? Right straight to Paris Island? Yes. That was for your basic training? Yes. Can you describe what that was like? It, 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 it was uh, hard and good and fair. They trained us very well. We were satisfied. We spent three weeks on a rifle range and the rest of the time was uh, on uh, learning uh, different things and, uh, and how to act and etiquette of the Marines. And that lasted a period of 13 weeks. Did you go with other Connecticut Marines, or did you go on your own? I joined with a friend of mine. It was just the two of us from this area at that time. So you went through basic training together? Yes, we did. Do you remember any of your instructors at basic? Uh, instructors? I, I remember the, uh, yes, the... The Sergeant Roach was in charge of our uh, squad, and I don't remember any other names. But I, I just want to add that the, the Marine that I joined with, he uh, went in. The, he he never came back. I came back, and he did not. Do you remember his name? Yes, George Neelands. N-E-A-L-N-E-S, I think, yes. Yeah. After your 13 weeks at Paris Island, where did you go? I went to Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. What did you do there? Just did some more close order drilling. We were just waiting to be assigned to wherever we were going to go. And uh, a few of us volunteered to go overseas. And after we were there in Camp of June for about two, two weeks, three weeks, we, went, they, we were sent to San Diego Marine Base and getting ready to ship out to go overseas into the Pacific. Did you receive any other special training at Camp Lejeune? No, none. Did you know what your assignment was going to be? No, nothing other than we were going to go overseas. Did you have a chance to go home before you shipped out, or did you go right no. to Camp Lejeune to San Diego? Went to San Diego. And did your friend George go with you then too? No, he, he, he went elsewhere. All right, when you shipped out of San Diego, do you remember what ship you were on? Yes. It was the Lure Line. Oh, yes. The Lure Line and the Matsonia Lines. The 
Fleur Line is the name of the ship, and it was run by the Matson Lines. And what was your trip like overseas? It took nine days, and at times the water was rough, and uh, we arrived in uh, American Samoa, as I indicated, nine days later. It was a luxury liner during peacetime. Yeah, did you get all the luxuries that went with it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We, there was six of us in a cabin for two. Oh, I guess not luxurious. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> did you have duties on ship or were you just no, passengers? just passengers on that ship. So actually it was probably run by the Navy. Well, which were your brothers in arms. Yeah, yeah well, there, there were civilians on there, but there was a, they had one gun and there was a big six-inch gun. Oh, there's some sailors there. They were the ones in charge. When you arrived on America Samoa, where did you go and what did you do? We arrived, with, we were sent out to the end of the island down what I call a jungle. And from there, we were assigned as machine gunners to take the, uh, to become machine gunners and to learn all about the 30 caliber Browning machine gun. So on America Samoa is where they assigned you to be a machine gunner? That's yes. Because you knew that's what you were going to learn? Yes, that is correct. And did they train you there on that 30 caliber Browning? Yeah, yes, we, we, we had what we call schooling. Uh, and that, that lasted, I would say, at least uh, a month. And at the same time we were having schooling, we built a machine gun range, which was 1,000 inches. They call it the 1,000-inch machine gun range. Why? Because I, that, the range for shooting was 1,000 inches? That's correct. So what did the schooling entail? Just practice, practice, practice? Yeah, well, it was school. A lot, a lot of book work and, and instructions by our sergeant uh, of how to operate the gun, learn every part of the gun, learn to take it apart, put it back together again, and all that. And then, of course, training, shooting the machine gun. And from what I understand, you're a pretty good shot? <laughs> I got very good on a test. It was a 97 on, on my written test. 97 out of 100? Yes. That was pretty good. How many men would you say were in your class for training? I, I, I would say there was probably about eight. That was eight. And then the sergeant, who was the teacher. Now, this unit that you trained with, were you going to stay together as a unit and go into combat together, or were you all going to split up after your training? No, we were going to stay right there and guard uh, American Samoa. We were that was we were the second defense battalion, and and we just stayed there and uh, by our machine guns waiting for action. Uh, did you always use the 30 caliber Browning? While I was there, yes. Can you tell me anything about that weapon? No, no, it was a very good, I think they had it in World War I even, and, uh, but it was, a, it was a good weapon, but, uh... You think you can uh, still take one apart? <laughs> no, not now, no, no. <laughs> but I could then. <laughs> How long did you stay on America Samoa? Five months. And then where did you go? We boarded a, a Liberty ship, the USS Biddle, and went to Wellington, New Zealand. What were you going to do there? 
We were waiting to pick up some more troops of, of the 2nd Marine Division, which we did do, but we were there uh, quite a while. About how long? Between the time we left Samoa and the time that we went into Tarawa from Wellington was 57 days. What did you do while you were on uh, New Zealand? We, we, we never got off the boat. We lived on the boat. We had to stay on the boat and uh, did practically nothing. Oh, boring. So you never actually stepped on the shore of New Zealand? Oh, yes, yeah. We, we, we had uh, Liberty a few times, yes. What did you we, do while you were on Liberty? Went to the local tavern. So you didn't get to see much of New Zealand. No, no, we did not. <laughs> yeah. When after your 57 days and you picked up additional troops, where did you go? Right to Tarawa. Did you know what your assignment in Tarawa was going to be? We knew what we were going or, or, a couple of days before we actually got there because they started trading, tell us where we were going to go in and how we were going to go and everything. But before that, we didn't know where we were going. Do you remember what your feelings were knowing you were going into Tarawa? Yes, but they told us it wasn't going to be much, that they were going to bomb the place uh, uh, from, the, with, from the air. They were going to, battleships were going to soften it up and we shouldn't have much trouble. So we didn't. We didn't worry too much about it. And your duty when you landed was going to be the machine gun? No, it was going to, then we was going to go in uh, on a 40 millimeter uh, anti-aircraft gun. So you knew how to operate that also? Yes, we, we, we learned that at American Samoa also. Do you remember when you landed on Tarawa? Yes, I certainly do. Can you describe what that was like? Do you remember the date? The date had to be November 21. Which year? 1943. Can you describe what that landing was like? Yeah, well, uh, yes. Once, uh, well, we come down the, the rope nets down with all our gear where we had three days of food and two canteens of water and 200 bullets to walk, come down that net which wasn't easy your fingers were being stepped on because the guy before we had about a 60 pound pack plus our rifle we got into the Higgins boat and we started to shore we got pretty near there, and they said, we can't get in. It's too bad, too bad, and too late in the day. So we pulled out in the Higgins boat. We stayed in the Higgins boat. They went back out, out of range of the Tarawa guns, and we stayed there overnight. During the early night, the Jap planes come in, strafing the beach along the water and the Higgins boats that were out in mud and the Amtrak uh, amphibious tractors. Next morning we got it, we woke, well we didn't work, we stayed there overnight and then... Uh, now you stayed in the Higgins boat all, all night? night? yes. Mm -hmm. And then the next morning we come and made our landings coming up onto Red Beach 2, which was along the pier that was sent, jutted out into the water and where the Jap machine gunners were lined up under the pier.
On the way in, on the Higgins boat, they transferred us two amphibious tractors. So we got aboard those, and then we came, and the tractor couldn't, couldn't get into the beach either. So we jumped off the side of the amphibious tractor uh, with our packs and our gear and ran ashore as quick as we could amongst the dead bodies that were floating around and in the way, both Marines and Japanese. And we got to the uh, concrete uh, log uh, embankment and we stayed there for a while. What is an amphibious tractor? Can you describe what that vehicle is? Uh, yes, that's a uh, tra uh, tractor. Well, it's got, uh, it's not a tank and it's not a boat. It's uh, got uh, caterpillar tractor wheels like a tank, but only you go on water and land. But it is not bulletproof or it doesn't have any protection. I don't know why they use them. I understand that. Out of the 110 or so that went in there, 90, 90 of them uh, were disabled erectors. At uh, that landing? At that landing, yeah. During the course of the two days of landing, three days. Do you remember about how many men, how many Marines were going ashore that day? No, I don't. In, in our bunch, there was probably uh, about 30 of us. Uh, that was coming in on a, at that time, but there was other coming aboard, coming in too. But I don't know. I just wasn't paying much attention to them. I was, <laughs> I was looking out for myself. Well, especially if you weren't expecting that kind of a welcome and you thought it was nothing, you must have been. Yeah. Oh well, everybody fine. was fine, but but this was not the first wave or the second wave. This was because there was. Marines got in, in before us, and they were in there fighting, and good, but, uh, uh, but they wanted us to go. They, the, the setup was we were a defense battalion, but this is the first time they're going to try to send the defense battalion in if, if the uh, other Marines had gotten into trouble. And I'm sure they did. There was a, there was a high ca casualty, I think pretty near 90% of the first few waves that went in were casualties. Were those all Marines? Yeah, all, all Marines. Uh, and that's were, why they sent in your defense? Yeah, then, then, they, then they sent us in to set up our gun for, for the defense, for the airplanes that were going to come in and uh, and for any other reason. They could also could use their guns for anti-tank too. Do you know what the casualty rate was for your unit? No, I have no idea. The uh, only thing I know that our executive officer, Captain Rose, was shot when the ramp went down for him to go ashore. Did you see that? No, I did not see that, but yeah. we heard it later, yes. <laughs> and he was your exec? He was the executive officer of our company. Now, were the Japanese also firing? Were they on the island as well as bombing from the air? Well, yes, yes. The only time that they that they Japanese came strafing you know, was was at night when we were in a Higgins boat, and then they came the next night. But no. Sure, there was 4,000 Japanese on this island. And, and, well, it doesn't sound like much, but the island was 800 yards wide and two miles long. That was the size of Bedio Island and 4,000 4, Japanese. And I think there was, you know, about 8,000 Marines trying to get aboard. So it was close, close fighting. Mm-hmm.
Now, once you did land and you got up to the barrier, you said that you stayed there for a, a short period. Stayed of time. there for a time, yeah, and then, then we moved up to near the airport runway, which was only a couple hundred yards up there. Yes. And what did you do there? Did you set your gun? Yeah, so we started to send the gun up and uh, be ready for the uh, planes to come in. We knew they'd be coming in at night again. But uh, I don't think that we that we got them up in time because before we knew it, it was night time and uh, the, the planes did come in again strafing and uh, dropping some bombs along the beach because they had their own Japanese forces back but they knew that that they you know from communications from the Japs around the island that the beach is where they wanted to do their damage. Hmm. And can you describe that night? You stayed right there in your positions? Yeah we stayed right there that night and sure enough the, the planes, as I said, were in, in a runway, and the Jap gasoline barrels of gasoline were there, and there was a little a building that was uh, dug out, and um, we uh, ma managed to crawl in there, and the the. Uh, the, uh, the gasoline from the strafing exploded and started burning and threw and, 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 and so did that little shack that we had found it started and so we had to leave that and get out but I understand that one of our uh, members of our unit on a 50 caliber machine gun shot down one of their planes so there was some satisfaction there. So when you left the burning shack, where did you go? We we just we just stayed just stayed, stayed near that. You're right there, dear. We didn't move. So you, well, spent you could. The night there? Yes, we stayed the night there, right? And then did you finish assembling your guns the next morning? Yes, next morning we did that, and uh, we, we then we got it all set up, and then we had a move again to another, to another spot on the second night and where somebody else had set up a gun so we didn't have to set up another gun and then then we waited it was it's pretty calm but we waited for at night when the bombers came again the high flying bombers now and our there was 90 millimeter gunners there too that would reach up there and the big spotlights that they turned on and put their spotlights on the planes coming in and then the 90 millimeter guns would be fired at them. And at that point were you manning the anti-aircraft gun? No, our, our, our gun would not, not, would not reach that high so we just stood by our gun waiting for a low flying planes. But there weren't any that night. Earlier you had told me about a foxhole incident. Was it on Tarawa that you, that this it, happened? Yes, yes. We all, it, we, when we first got there, we dug our foxholes, which we were told to do. That's the first night? That was the first night, yes. And, uh, and, uh, and it, we, I had the first watch. I ha had the because we were going to take turns staying awake. Half could sleep and half stayed awake. And after my watch, which uh, I laid down in my foxhole, and uh, before I knew it, somebody had jumped into my foxhole, and uh, and it scared. And naturally, I was really upset because we were told before to watch out for the Japs to jump into the foxhole with you and knife you. And therefore I thought that this was a uh, Jap that was on me and I'm trying to reach and get my knife, which I have here, 
and um, and it was going to stab the person there. It was yelling at me, yelling at me. Oh, I'm so and so, so and so, but I still didn't believe him because the Japs would also talk in English. But eventually, this all happened in a few seconds. Uh, that uh, I found out that it was, that it was one of my fellow Marines. And I asked him, uh, and I said, how in the heck could you fall in a foxhole on me like, like this? He said, well, I had to had a, uh, go uh, out and relieve myself. And so when I was rolling back to my foxhole, he said, because that's he didn't want to stand up and walk around, uh, I, I fell right into your foxhole, rolled right into it. I said, well, you're lucky you're alive. And that was the episode of that night. Yeah, he is lucky. He's lucky he couldn't get your knife out in time. <laughs> that is correct. Yeah. Now, the second day of fighting, um, what happened? That's the second day that I was there, yes. Uh, not, not, not much. We... Uh, we we did, we just waited around most of the time. We uh, had to move up uh, again a little uh, a little ways, and uh, and it was still pretty rough going. And uh, I, I I can remember and that that I was moving up also, and there was some Marines going back towards the shore to. Uh, Rest or, or go, whatever they're going to do, and I my and I my original amount of water was two canteens, and I was down to one quarter of a canteen of water, and uh, I was getting worried because I'm going to be out of water pretty soon. And when these people were walking back, I uh, said to them, I said. You fellas had headed back? Yeah. I said, do you have any water you could give me? Because I'm I'm low. I'm pretty out of water. And he says, no, take, get it out of the tank. And I said, the tank? What, uh, what are you talking about? He said, there's a tank out another another uh, 10 or 20 yards. Uh, I said, yeah, but that's a Jap water tank. I don't want to drink Jap water. No, he said, it's, it's American. It's our, it's our water tank. Oh, so sure enough, we went another few yards, and there there was that tank. And, and to this day, I don't know how that water tank was there, but it was one of the happiest moments I had on that island because I was worried about water. <laughs> that's That was that incident. Mm -hmm. And your rations must have get, been getting low by then. Yeah, the rations, the, the food rations uh, weren't, weren't, weren't uh, yeah, they were lasting out pretty good. As I said, we had three days. And this was at the end of the second day. And, uh, but uh, you, can, you can live a while without food, but not too long without water. Yeah. Especially right on the equator. This island is just about on the equator. After the second night, um, you were the, on the third day on the island. Uh, what happened then? Not not much of everything. Things had really cooled down. The, uh, the up up ahead had cooled down, and everything was uh, seeming pretty good. And and we didn't have too many worries. We still uh, had to post our guards and go out and, and for and do everything that you do when when you're winding it down. And uh, but I can't remember anything too uh, happening. Uh, so how much longer did you stay there? We we stayed in in, in that spot. Uh, I think we moved out the next day again. To another another gun position, uh, uh, and then uh, not not much happened. But another incident that happened uh, that night, I was I had a uh, another Marine and I were assigned to go up ahead a ways and 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 uh, guard 
another gun who had been left vacant. And dur dur during uh, the action there, I also picked up a carbine, which another Marine had and was, uh, was dead. So I picked that up and I took that along with my rifle. And I, uh, so I had the two of them and I left my rifle back where the rest of the squad was and I took the carbine and uh, went up and uh, stayed overnight with this other Marine and nothing really happened there but you know ready so he slept a few hours then I'd sleep a few hours and so when the morning came we were coming back walking back to our rest of our squad I uh, saw a uh, a bird there, a seagull that was making a racket on a post there. So I said, I said, well, I'm going to put him out of his misery. And I went and I aimed my the carbine and it all at once was click. It didn't work. I didn't know that when I went down there. And I'm very fortunate that we didn't have any action and that night, night while we were there. When I got back, I got rid of that carbine. Got your own gun back. <laughs> yeah, I had my own rifle back, right. And what happened after that? When did you actually get off of the island? Well, uh, well we, we stayed another day, I think on the fourth day, we were working on our guns, and uh, we got word uh, from uh, somewhere, I don't know, our, our uh, corporal, he, he was the one who would tell us what you know, was going on because he had a connect, uh, phone connection now hooked up with the CP. Uh, and uh, we're told that at 10 o'clock that we were to stop doing what we were doing and look in a certain direction, I can't remember which direction, because they were going to raise the American flag uh, at that time. So, uh, so at 10 o'clock came, then we did what we were told. We stood there and faced what we were supposed to, and uh, they, 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 I could not see this. But the, they raised the flag, I believe. But we were told that the American flag didn't go up first. The British flag, they raised the British flag first because it was a British island and the Japs took it from the British uh, before that. And so the American flag went on next. So we were all very upset over that, which, <laughs> which uh, could do that. But, just I thought that was an inc incident that would be interesting. Yeah, is, uh, were there any British serving on the island? Oh, no, the no, so no, no, all, all, all Americans. Now, yep. had you routed the Japanese off the island at that point, or were they still fighting? Oh, no, that was all over. When, when that went up, then uh, in, in five days, there was no more action at all. And now I understand you picked up a Japanese rifle somewhere along the way? Yes, I did. That's when there was more action going on. And I still have that Japanese rifle. Was that on today. Tarawa too? That was on Tarawa, yes. Tarawa was the only only island that I saw action on. Yep. Were you awarded any medals or citations? I know you were. Yes, I was, a, I was uh, sent by, from, from the Department of the Navy all, all the medals that I was entitled to, including the Presidential Unit Citation for our, for our uh, outfit, which was the Special Weapons uh, of the 2nd Defense Battalion attached to the 2nd Marine Division. Is that the same unit that you served in throughout the war? Yes. Through my, in my period of war, yes. That the was. other medals and citations that John received were the Good Conduct Medal, the Asiatic 
Pacific Campaign Medal with one Bronze Star, World War II Victory Medal, the American Campaign, Presidential Unit Citation Ribbon, as you stated, the Marine Corps Sharpshooter Rifle Badge, and Honorable Service Lapel Pen. John, were you a sharpshooter? Yes. How'd you get that badge? By shooting well at the target in the range. Was that back in basic? That was in, in ba basic first, but then uh, one other time a after that we had to take take the go to the range again, and I, again I was, uh, got a sharpshooter medal. And for for that being a sharpshooter, we see received additional three dollars a month, additional to our fifty four dollars a month pay, which we were supposed to receive. Why were you such a good shot? Had you been, had experience at home before joining the military with guns? Uh, yes, I was familiar with with the rifles, and uh, but they do good training. I mean, anybody that never shot a rifle could become a sharpshooter if they put their mind to it. Yeah. Did you receive any injuries while you were in combat? Uh, well, yes and no. The only injury that I received was a, a rip in my leg from from the barbed wire on Tarawa coming through there, and my calf on my leg was uh, I mean the pants were ripped and my leg was ripped open. But that was uh, not nothing serious, nothing. Just uh, of course we had bandages and we had stuff that we could take care of ourselves. And now I'm going to ask you some questions about daily life. How did you stay in touch with your family while you were in the service? It's, I sent them uh, letters, and they sent me letters. So it was good mail service? Uh, considering, I would say yes. I had no complaints, but went a long time without getting mail. And, and uh, because, you know, we kept moving around. Uh, now it's a board ship for 57 days. We've got none then, of course. But what interesting thing, you're talking about mail. Uh, you could never say where you were located dur during the war. I mean, this was a big secret. You know? And what surprised me, uh, after about five or six days on the island in Tarawa, they told us that we could write home and tell them where we were, that we were in that battle, which was surprising to me. I never heard of it before, and everybody was surprised. <laughs> yeah. So in all your letters home, you never told them where you were except Tarawa? Well, while I, while I was uh, overseas, yes, that's correct. They didn't have any idea where I was, no. But I did write to my sister then uh, and told her I was at Tarawa, and I left it up to her. If she if she wanted to tell my mother and father, because that was a real bad battle, you know, and I said up to her, so. But I understand that she didn't say anything for a week or two weeks, and one night uh, that they, they were sitting around talking about me, and my mother said to my sister, I believe he's in Bougainville, because that was going on at the same time. And my sister said to my mother, uh, no, Ma, I don't think he is. And I went. So your sister was at your parents' house, and and she said, no, I don't think he's in Bougainville? Yes, that's what she said, yeah. And, uh, and she uh, went and got the letter and showed it to my mother. And my mother was then all upset, but because uh, while there was no more fighting going on the island, because the bombers were still coming in every night. I think we had uh, uh, bombings every night, or at least every other night. And, it, and as long as I was on that island, there was bombing. So, so that's you know, and mothers do worry. Oh, they certainly yeah. do. Well, she must have been relieved to know that you could write the letter after the battle. Yeah. Besides that you're still around. Yeah. 
<laughs> what was the food like in the service? Oh, it was it was all right. It was uh, nothing was so great. Of course, when when we were on the island, we had the C rations and K rations for pretty near pretty near three or four weeks, and then they finally got some kitchens set up and. Uh, we had uh, which is which is fine. We were there on on, on Thanksgiving um, Thanksgiving Day. This was in that's it's in November, and uh, you were on Tarawa. Oh, I was on Tarawa, yeah. And it, it was uh, it was tough going, but it wasn't bad. We uh, and this was the first time that we had a warm meal since we left the ship, because we built a little fire and we heated. Our can, can of uh, cans of food that we had, but that was the first time I had yeah, and uh, that's why I left one in too long and it exploded in the fire because it got too hot. But I had another one by that time anyway. <laughs> so, so, and uh, that was on Thanksgiving Day. And, uh, on Thanksgiving Day, you were still eating canned rations. Yeah, that yeah. Cool? That was, yeah, that's right. We're still on a race, and that that was the first time we had it warm. Before that, we eat everything cold. And so, yeah, and, yeah. What's the difference between a C ration and a K ration? Well, a K ration is like crackers and dry stuff. C rations are cans of, of cans of food, like hash or whatever it might be. I forget exactly what to do. And uh, and one day that I was was eating what in the, the sea rash can rations were like this like a tuna fish can it's kind of kind of flat and round and I opened it up one hand with my knife or however I got it and pulled it open and I went to eat it and, and there, there was flies a thousand flies that flew in there be, uh, uh, on my food to uh, and I, and, and I couldn't, I had to hold my can with one hand and eat with the other hand. And I, by the time I put the flies out and get back there, those flies were back there. And they were there and there was, I'd say, probably an inch, inch and a half of flies. So what I did, I was so hungry, I just put that knife in front and I ate the flies and all. And that that's exactly the truth, and that's the way it was. I said, "The hell with it," and they didn't taste too bad, if I remember correctly. You know, but I had to eat. <laughs> this, there was there was approximately five thousand dead people on that island, so there's a lot of flies. You know. Oh God, that would be memorable. <laughs> when you weren't on the island. Did you have regular food, or do, do you have C-rations and K-rations? Oh, no. Well, see, from there, I flew out of there to a hospital in Hawaii, so I was back, you know, with decent. When you were in New Zealand and on America Samoa, did they have regular kitchens and regular food? Well, in New, in New Zealand, they said we ate right on the ship, so that was it. And, uh, yes, they had a regular, uh, in Samoa, they had regular uh Regular food, but we were way out in the uh, I call it the jungle part. It was, it was food was good. Yep. Did you have enough uh, supplies and materials that you needed? Yes. Did you feel any pressure or stress? Oh yeah, you bet. So, uh, of, course, of course, they handled it different in those days. What did you do about stress? Well, how did you guys handle it then? Well, pretty good. They were they were they were pretty good because everybody was in the same boat, and uh, you, you you just you know you can do a lot. You know, person really do a lot. Uh, the pressure was was getting ready to to, to go into into battle. Uh, you know what I. Uh, we were going to go in, in in a day or so, and I can remember standing by the uh, 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 a grinding wheel, sharpening my bayonet, 
and thinking, you know, this is it, you know. I'm I'm sharpening this to stick it into somebody, you know. And uh, and of course, it, it, you know, although they're the enemy and everything else, it's you know. But once you're there, it's it's easy. But uh, not not nothing was easy. But uh, I was concerned and a stretch. And they uh, said uh, the first day before anybody went in, I was that uh, we're going to have mass at 3.30 in the morning, you know, before the troops go in. They can, you know, uh, go to mass, come out, and have, uh, and then they had to talk about food, steak, and eggs uh, that morning. And uh, Where was the mass held? Unshipped. The, the, we're all on board ship, yeah. We were just, just uh, uh, you know, right, ready to, to go in uh, to the battle, to, to the you island. You that mass? You attended that mass? No, this is what happened. I, I, I was up. I didn't. I couldn't sleep, and I was up the night before on guard duty on the boat. They just give you a job. You're supposed to stand in, and and uh, and, I, and I couldn't sleep. I went to uh, bed early enough, you know, about eight eight o'clock or so, and I couldn't sleep, and I couldn't sleep, and finally I fell asleep, and when I woke up, mass was over. And that bothered me too because not a big religious person, but I was an altar boy for five years, and uh, and I and I had faith, and uh, so so that was a big disappointment. So that was my <laughs> talking about pressure and what you do for it. I was going to church and uh, and pressure. And we were on that Higgins boat coming in. I can remember, and there was a lot of mumbling going on in that Higgins boat. Of course, what it was, everybody praying, and uh, you know, so you know, me along with the rest of them. But, yes, you remember what prayers you were saying? You well, know, the Our Father and the Hail Mary and the Act of Contrition, because I wanted to have a, I wanted to have a clean, uh, clean health, clean uh, Yeah, uh huh. <laughs> And I understand you told me earlier um, about your rosary beads. Oh, yes, yes. My rosary beads, yep. These are the rosary beads before I went in. Instead of taking my glasses off, I just... That's where they were. They were on there for the six days that we that they were there. And I had my dog tags there. Also on there. So you wore your rosary beads around your neck for that entire time the, you were on tour? No, not entirely, but w while the action was going on, we yeah. took them off uh, after the fifth. The These are the very same ones. And they're, they're, you can see the crosses all rusted. Yeah. Yeah. And and other Marines did too. This is, you know. I was the Lord, a lot of them, yes. Was there anything special you did for good luck? In addition to your rosary beads and your prayers, I know some guys, you know, have rabbit's foot or good lucky charms or something. No, but just to be very, very careful, that's that's the only, you know, I had no lucky charms or anything else. No. How did people entertain themselves? Did you have any kind of entertainment? No, none whatsoever. And on the boat or on Tarawa. Did you get to see any USO shows? No. Anywhere? Nowhere, no. When you were on the boat, what did you do for recreation? Nothing. Nothing. 57 days of war. <laughs> Except... In New Zealand, we did get off the boat, a, you know, couple, three or four times. Uh, did you ever get any R&R? &R? Well, no, no, I, 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 not, not until I went to the hospital. Really? So you had no breaks or anything? No, no, I, I never got home even for, for a couple of years. Did you travel anywhere else while you were in the service? Well, we know you were in New Zealand and you didn't get to see much of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, the American Samoa, Pango, Pango, there was nothing there. There was only one vehicle on Hull Island, and that was, uh, I mean, one car. There was trucks, of course, yeah. 
but there was nothing there. We uh, we had a walk, I think it was probably six miles. We were out that jungle, I call it six miles. We went to the dentist twice when I was there. And, and it's a six mile walk, which was, you know, an hour and a half, two hours. Twelve mile return trip? What, what, yeah, that's, I see that six miles back, too. Oh, yeah. But you, you can do it. A, a Marine walks four miles an hour, so uh, an hour and a half in, an hour and a half back. So, yeah. Were there any particularly humorous or unusual events that you can recall? Mm -hmm. Did you guys ever play pranks on each other? No, not no, no. I don't. I don't remember that at all. No. What did you think of the officers and your fellow soldiers? Oh, I guess you don't call them soldiers. Your fellow Marines. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, yeah, they, they were all all right, uh, nice, e except this uh, Captain Rose who was shot. He uh, he uh, was not a very nice individual. He was nice, and the rumor was that he might have been shot by a Marine because they really didn't like him. <laughs> and I think in some of this stuff that my daughter has, that somebody mentioned that. And Oh, is that, I know I saw it on the... Uh, Computer. Somebody mentioned that uh, that there was a rumor. It was, and, and I knew that rumor back there, back in the island. So. But the rest of them were fine. All the Marines were good. Uh, yeah. Did you make any friendships with your fellow Marines? Yes, I had a very close relationship with uh, with uh, a friend of mine who lives in Massachusetts. And we visited after the war for a number of years. Do you until, remember his name? Yes, Fleming. James Fleming. No, I'm sorry. Bill Fleming. Excuse me. That's okay. B B yeah, Bill, Bill, Bill Fleming. Do you still keep in contact no, with him? No, unfortunately he died. Uh, he didn't uh, die many years ago. But I... But we used to go back and forth when he was alive. Are there any other Marines that you kept in touch with? Yes, I I did, but they all, you know, they dropped out like everything else. Just uh, there, there are none now that uh, that I know that are alive. Did you keep a uh, personal diary or a journal while you were in the service? No, as against regulations. Yeah, it was, yeah. Wow. Where did you go once you left Tarawa? I went to the hospital in Hawaii, Aia Heights Naval Hospital. What's the name of it? Aia Heights. Aia Heights in Hawaii? Yes. Mm -hmm. now, it's Naval Hospital. It's a, it was a Navy hospital. Then. And why did you go there? For your leg? No, because I, I had got the a jungle disease. F Filariasis is the name of it. What's that? Don't, <laughs> that's from a, a, a black and white female mosquito. <laughs> yeah. So how sick were you? Well, not uh, well. I was bothered enough that they took me out of uh, Tarawa and put me on an ambulance plane and sent me there, and or I stayed there and uh, yeah, hides for probably about two two weeks. Then placed aboard a ship and sent to the hospital in in uh, Seattle, Washington. No, excuse me, Oak. Okno Hospital in Okno, California. And then was shipped to Seattle. What was it like staying the two weeks in the uh, Naval Hospital in Hawaii? What uh, did they do for you anyway? Uh, nothing. There's not, nothing they can do, but they've got to get you out of that out of the South Pacific there and uh, not to go back. And 
there's really no treatment for this. But the, what was nice when I was uh, uh, there, I ran into a nurse who was from Broadbrook, uh, and she was a Navy nurse, and, and uh, which uh, which uh, I uh, knew from back here, and she spied me and uh, asked me, you know, aren't you Jack P. from Broadbrook? And I says, yeah, and you know. I'm, I wasn't feeling good. My head was still buzzed up, I think, because uh, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. And uh, so she says, I'm on duty now. She says, but tomorrow, 9 o'clock or something like that, I'll, I'll come and you know, we'll, we'll visit. I said, sure. So we went there, and she was very nice. We sat down in the room by herself, and uh, she asked if anything like she could do for me. And I said, no, no. Don't want anything at all, no. How about a bottle of uh, whiskey? Would you like that? Because officers could get them, but of course, most of them could. And I said, no, no, I, I don't know. I, I just wasn't with it. And do you so, remember her name? Yes, I do. Her name was Dorman. I can't remember her first name. Uh, Eleanor. Eleanor Dorman. That's exactly who it was. Did you see her later when you both came back to Broadbrook? No, no. And unfortunately, I think that she, that she died while she was a Navy nurse. Uh, but she wasn't old. I mean, just I was a surprise. But I, I never, I never did uh, see her again after I left there. But it was good again for my uh, dear old mother because I wrote home and told them that you know that here I am. They knew I was in the Navy hospital, but they didn't know where. They didn't know what was wrong with me. And uh, and uh, so, but I told them, that, uh, so that my mother went to see this girl's mother, who only lived uh, a little ways away, quarter of a mile. And uh, so, I and I don't remember whether my mother knew where, or whether Elder Dorman's mother knew that she was in Hawaii or not. I do not know, but uh, but anyway, they had, the, the nurse told her that I was all right and all of that, because they wrote to each other. And, and that was it. While you were in Hawaii, did you uh, have a chance to see Pearl Harbor and the bombings that had been done there? Uh, no, no, I did not. No. You were in the hospital the whole time? You didn't get to see anything else on the island? Well, yes. One afternoon, I couldn't get any pass, so I got dressed, put on my uniform, and went and climbed over the fence and went to to uh, to town. And for a couple hours, then I come back and crawled over the fence back and get into my pajamas and. And uh, that, that was what I saw of Hawaii. <laughs> but at least I saw a part of... Uh, I, oh. And from Seattle, Washington, where did you go? Then I went to Sun Valley, Idaho, Naval Hospital. How come they kept moving you from all these hospitals? Well, this is a convalescent hospital because they didn't know what the heck to do, I guess, because I was not able for duty in, in the men and able So there, I, I stayed there the longest. Uh, I stayed there until June of 1944. And still never be at home. So you no leave home no, the entire no. time from when you were no, that, that until uh, June of uh, 1944, when they said, "Okay, you you know you're ready to go back to duty, and we're going to give you 30 days leave, and you report to uh, Birmingham, Washington uh, at the end of your leave." So I I did come home in June of 1944, which was a year and a half after I uh, left. And you home. got 30 days leave. Yes. What was that like getting your 30? leave after all that time. No, pretty good. I got on a train 
and in five days arrived in Hartford, Connecticut, and come home, and of course everybody was excited. And I, uh, my mother was working in the in the mill in in Brabrook. They were making uh, navy blankets and navy uh, in the mill here in Brabrook, and so I went to my sister worked there also. So I went to see my sister. She was the secretary to a superintendent or somebody like that. So she got off of work. I went and got my mother out of out of the mill and come walking up, and there I was. <laughs> Oh, no, they didn't know you were coming? No, they didn't know, no. Oh, what a surprise. Yeah. Well, they knew I was coming, but they didn't know oh, when. Man. Yeah, yeah. Because I didn't know myself, you know. Wow. Was so, what did you that, do on your 30-day leave? I know you told me you also went over to Hamilton Standard. Yeah, I went to Hamilton Standard to visit them and uh, and went to the uh, gasoline racing board and talked them into giving me some coupons for... Uh, for gas, so I could go around and visit my relatives, of course. Uh, so they did. They gave me um, some gas. I think it was, uh, I think it was uh, 15, 16 gallons. You know, which was pretty good. You know, and, uh, but I had to prove that I was was where I was. You know, and uh, so they did. So t took that took about four days, and. Like every other one, I, I am now 22 years old, so I was old enough to go into a cocktail lounge now and then and spent a few hours there. Uh, and uh, then got on a train and went back to uh, Birmingham, Washington. Then went to Birmingham, Washington. Now, in Birmingham, Washington, you were expecting to get a new assignment? But not no, that was my assignment there, oh, and and a guard. It was a naval ammunition depot where they made uh, ammunition and uh, powder and bullets, uh, and then they had these uh, uh, storage places uh, out in the woods and all that. And then, so that was my job to patrol that uh, along with the other Marines, uh, four hours on and eight hours off. And, Four hours on. Well, that was quite different from the lifestyle you had previously in the Marine Corps. What was it like when you were in Birmingham? Bur Bur Birmingham. Yeah, I always pronounce it wrong. <laughs> Birmingham. Yeah, it was a there was a naval shipyard there too. Yeah, well, uh, it, it was good, you know. It was, but there was not much to do out there. We used to go to Seattle across the use the ferry to go across to Seattle and. Uh, there used to be a uh, a dance hall there, and uh, tree and on ga uh, dance dance hall, and uh, not much. You know, to have to go to the local tavern and uh, try to keep out of trouble. How long did you stay there? I stayed there until I was discharged in February of 1946. You remember your last day in service? I certainly do, yes. You can describe it? Yes. Well, I uh, went down and got my discharge from the commanding officer. Went down, they called me in and gave me a discharge. And uh, I went down to the local pub there where, uh, where I used to go when I, when I was, before I got discharged. And they, they had a party for me that afternoon and night in... Uh, and uh, the next morning, I oh, and I went back. I shouldn't have done this, but I went back and I stayed in the barracks. They let me stay in the barracks that uh, that night after the party. Of course, there's been drinking and all that. And uh, next morning, got on a train and headed uh, headed home. So then you took the train all the way home to Connecticut. Yes. What did you do in the days and the weeks right after you got out of the service? Well, for, for the first month, well, we are, all the gang would get together. All the soldiers, soldiers, and of course, they, 
We had a favorite watering hole that we used to get together with, uh, you know, probably about noontime. And stay there as long as you could last. That, that, that was it. And, uh, and then after about three weeks, uh, I went uh, back to uh, work at Hamilton Standard Propeller. And what was your job there? The job there was an uh, uh, inspector of rough materials coming in that was uh, that was shipped in. And you test it to see it was the right stuff and measure it and all of that stuff. Test it for hardness and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I did that for quite a while. Then I was given a then I was given a job of uh, of testing uh, the uh, measuring gauges that they were used to do this in uh, all, all the first part it was inspecting the uh, and uh, setting the gauges back to where they were be and testing to see that they were correct did you go back for any additional schooling yes I did what did you do when I was uh, uh, working at uh, Hamilton standard propeller I uh, went and uh, took a test to go to school. I wanted to go to college, but I couldn't I couldn't pass the test for Yukon. So I uh, went and I signed up at uh, Hillier College. Hillier? Hillier, H-I-L-L-Y-E-R. It, it was in Hartford. And uh, I went there nights. I continued to work at Hamilton from 7.30 to 4, go home, get something to eat, and then go to school in Hartford, I was, uh, which was about a 10, 12 mile ride at 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock, three nights a week. I took a full college course in the evening and, and worked the... Uh, 48 hours. We worked six days a week in Hamilton, uh, going to school there for uh, for the next uh, three years. Off and uh, uh, business administration. Did you go through school on the GI Bill? Yes, I did. See, I was I was considered a disabled vet. I, I had a disability, and uh, therefore I had a little bit of edge. I was getting eleven dollars and fifty cents a month disability. After you graduated, then from Hillier, what did you do? Well, number one, I didn't graduate. I, I went to for three years. Not, I went to work at uh, in an insurance company in May of nineteen forty-eight. Which company? It was then. It was the Resolute Insurance Company. In Hartford? In Hartford, yes. What's they're they're on Chapel Street in Hartford. What did you do for them? Well, then because I was I, was, I got a job as uh, accountant trainee, and it was a a, a GI scheduled uh, program, two years as a as a vet and two years of schooling, and then I'd be a, an accountant. So I did that. When I finished my two years, then I can remember I was very happy. They gave me a $300 bonus. That was my thing from the government for completing my uh, schooling. Mm -hmm. Then did you stay on as an accountant for the Resolute Insurance Company? Yes, I did for, for some time, yes. I was uh, assistant controller for a while of the insurance company. And then uh, I was elected assistant secretary. Then I was a secretary of the, there was two companies then. There was the life company and the casualty company, Resident Life Insurance Company and Resident Insurance Company. And uh, then I left, I was taken out of the accounting and put in charge of the life company operation uh, as 
you might say, chief operating officer. I was I had a president over me, and but uh, and I was made vice president of of it. And from for the last ten years that I worked, that was my job. You stayed with the Resolute Insurance Company for your entire career. Yeah, it, it was the same company, but they changed names. It was sold, and they changed its name. It ended up as Celtic Life Insurance Company. So how many years did you end up actually being with them when you retired? Thirty-eight years, from forty-eight to eighty-three. Wow. Now that would be thirty-five years though. But no, I was there thirty-eight years ago because I worked there afterwards. Uh, you know, as a consultant, but uh, still, I was, I was still. The last time I worked there was in ninety-five, I think. Wow. I mean, as a consultant, not as a, but I was an employee from 48 to 83, so that'd be 35 years, I guess. Did you join any veterans organizations after yeah. you left the service? Yeah, I belong to the uh, American Legion. And which post is that? Uh, that uh, East Windsor, post number 40. Do you remember when you joined? Uh, was it right after you left the service or not until years later? It was uh, it was probably about four years later. So you've been a member for a long time. Well, yes. Are you actively involved in that post now? No. What are some of the? I, I'm a, I'm a member, but I but I don't take an active part yet. What were some activities that you did participate in? None. Have you gone to any reunions? Uh, uh, no, okay. no, we never had any of the. No. The unit never did? No. I'm a life member of the veterans uh, organization, too. The VFW? Yeah. The East Windsor Post? Do you know what number no, that is? No, that's Windsor Lodge Post. Oh. And I don't... You don't do anything with them? No. I don't know the number either. That's okay. Now... I know you got married and had kids. So when did you uh, when did you find time to get married? In there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I found time. Yeah, we got married August twenty three in nineteen forty seven. And you even remember it? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you know now uh, your now wife before you went in the service? Yes. Did you write to her while you were in the service? No. So you got acquainted after you got out? Well, yes. And? But, uh, we, uh, she was, she was uh, lived in Broadbrook, and I lived in Broadbrook, so we don't, but then she moved to South Windsor, and I still stayed in Broadbrook. And, uh, the, not to prolong it, but what happened is a friend of mine was getting married. I was in a wedding party. And she was uh, in a wedding party, a friend of the girl, and uh, we got to know each other that day over champagne, and uh, then we started going out, and eventually in, in February uh, 47, we were engaged, and, and, and in August we got married. And did you have any children? Yes, we had three. One uh, one died uh, early in birth, and uh, right after he was born, and it had uh, Susan and John. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? I, I would say yes, yes. I'm a great, you know, believer in the Marines. I think they're great. I think the country is great. I, I, I love my country. I like the flag. It's, and uh, yes, I, I do because I can understand how they feel. And sometimes I feel very sorry for some of them, what they're going through. And uh, but. Yes, it, it has. I, I think it helped develop me as, a, as an individual, too. How did your military service affect your life? Oh, 
Oh, very much so. Uh, uh, one of the big things was it gave me the opportunity to go to college, you know, and, and that, that's what did it. And uh, I was not a good student in uh, in high school, so I couldn't get into college. And, uh, even though, uh, you know, I, I, I used to uh, play basketball in high school, and uh, my high school coach, who was Hugh Greer, was the UConn coach of the UConn team out there uh, in stores, and even he couldn't get me in. So I went to see him. So so if it wasn't for the, for the military, uh, you know, I couldn't go to school. I didn't have the money, and I didn't have the the smarts to uh, pass a test, but I did all right anyway in the end. <laughs> I guess you sure did. Are there any memorable experiences from your military that you would like to add? Yes, I'd like to uh, tell you, uh, I don't know, uh, well, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. The, uh, when I was in American Samoa, they had it lined up and they wanted somebody to volunteer to go out in a boat with some natives to uh, to look to see if there might be any down flyers out there, you know. Uh, and I really didn't understand what the hell it was all about, but... Uh, so we all lined up, and they said, those oh, volunteers step forward. You know, and I'm a young new Marine, and uh, I, I I thought everybody would, would volunteer, so I stepped forward. You hadn't heard that about, part about don't volunteer? Yeah, <laughs> no, no, I hadn't. That's right. And, and guess what? When I looked around, nobody else would step forward. You were the only one? Only one. Yes, ma'am, that is correct. So the lieutenant... Came, he says, you're a volunteer? And I says, yes. He said, well, you know, it's not an easy job. And, you know, you don't have to go just because, uh, you know, we're looking for volunteers, but you don't have to go. You can say, I says, no, I'll go. So he thought for a minute. He says, all right, all right. Uh, so... Uh, he says, tomorrow, you know, we we'll go, come here at such and such time, and we'll go, and uh, we'll make plans. So that's where I went, and um, saw him. He says, you know, you can still back out. He didn't want me to go, you know, but I'm, gonna start. I'm only 19, you know, or just turned 19. And uh, I says, oh, no, I'll go, I'll go, because I had too much pride to, to not go. I wasn't too happy about going. He says, well, he says, you can't, uh, he says, there's going to be uh, five men in a boat, I forget, five or six. He says, uh, and you're going to sit in the bow of the boat and they're going to do the rowing. It's just the boat, it had one of those things on the side, I don't know, I don't forget what they call them, but it's just, just, just a canoe with a, with a native canoe with, with the outboard out there. So he says, uh, I was going to give you, you know, take my 45, my gun, he says, be probably easier. But then on the other hand, he says, maybe you better uh, off with your rifle. And he says, he says, you can take, when you put your clip in the gun, he says, leave the bullet in the chamber. Otherwise, when you're in guard to it anywhere, you have to, you have to take one bullet out so there be no bullet in the chamber. He says, because he says, I don't, you know, how much we can trust these people, so be ready to defend yourself if these natives have any idea. So that, that made me feel a little bit worse. And uh, anyway, I got in the boat, and, uh, and he says, you're go, going to go to this island. He didn't go with you? No, 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 no. Just I'm alone with these natives. He didn't go anywhere. No, <laughs> no, he wouldn't go. And uh, go to the silent, he says, and uh, don't go ashore. He says, uh, but just, you know, look, look around and see if there's any, you know, that needs help. And uh, 
So I said, okay. So I went, and we went out there, and we went, and they were rolling. And, and, and those men, I don't know how they do it. They, they were rolling, you know, for hours and hours. And uh, I was sitting there. I had no idea where we were. Sometimes I, I couldn't see land. And so finally we go around, and they, this land, this island, which I thought he was talking about, this is after about six hours, seven hours. Uh, they pull up there and uh, and they're telling me they're motioning me to get out to go to go on this island and uh, and, and I can't talk to them because I, I want to tell them they told me not to go on the island. No, 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 wait with me to go because I guess they want to get rid of me and go collect their money and go to it. So, so I said, all right. So I got out. I says, well, I don't. I don't think that I had my ammunition belt or anything, but I did have uh, eight bullets. And uh, so I got out, I said, I didn't know what the heck to expect. So I uh, look around for a while, and guess what? The lieutenant is there. So we did all the way around, so, you know, I was really confused. I thought I was at the island, and I was back in, in America some where I was supposed well, to be. Where, where it started out. from, yeah, yeah. So was I glad to see him, but we, so he said, "Did you see anybody out there?" So I says, "No." He says, "Oh no, over oh, everything all right?" I says, "Yeah." And then, then later, I don't know if it's later, but you see, I don't know if you read about about John Kennedy, ex-president, how his boat PT one hundred nine got sunk and they were on this island. And, you know, and the natives come and saw them, but they couldn't talk to them or anything. So I guess that's why they were sending me out with they so we could talk to the, talk to the uh, people, to the down flyers, if there happened to be uh, down flyers or whatever it was. But I couldn't talk to the natives either. So, uh, but anyway, that, that, that's, that was my experience. Uh, Did that teach you about volunteering? No. No. You your well, yeah. Do you, you want to hear another one? Yes. Okay, so then we're still we're in American Samoan yet, and they had this big eight-inch gun that they, that they were going to fire, test fire to see if the target's going to go by. So they're short of, short of uh, Marines there. There's some that, I don't know, are out. I don't know what happened. Anyway, they wanted somebody to volunteer to go load this gun. Now, this gun is underground. And uh, down under, and, and in this space probably as big as uh, these three rooms down here at the end. So we we go down there, and they tell me what to do. And the guy says to me, he says, All right, uh, the sergeant says, uh, here, here's some cotton, put it in your ear. I said, you know? I, said I don't need any cotton. He said, I put it, he said, well, you'd be better off with it. And I said, uh, no, I don't need it, you know. And so they use these bags of powder, if you want. So I have to go and give it and hand it to this guy, and he puts it in a gun. And this guy grab another one, put it on, put it in about three of those bags of powder. And okay, then they shot that gun off. When I shot that gun off, I went completely deaf. I could I could see the people's uh, lips moving, but I couldn't hear anything. It's a oddest feeling. It's the first time in my life. I was absolutely silenced, you know, and I was, boy, I was scared. But what, I, there's nothing I could do, but now they're going to fire to get again, and I got to get these bags, the stuff, and hand it. And all of a sudden, this ear popped. I started to hear after and, and some more. And then, by the time that we, so that, oh, before they fired the next time, we said to the guy, give me some, uh, Give me some uh, cotton, you know, e even though I, I couldn't hear. I, I, I didn't want to have any more trouble. And uh, so then then the other ear came back, but it's still busted up in there. Yeah. And that's that's why you see me having trouble walking because of, you know, I hang on to stuff because of my balance. And that's... Uh, so that ear has been messed up ever since... Ever, ever since, uh, yeah. Yeah. You've had problems with your balance ever since. Well, I I, I did off and on. Yes, I had, but I could go pretty well. But now it's I get I'm going to be 82, 
you know, it, it it's, it's not that very good. I had trouble with my back, so now I, uh, I blame him, but, but now that's where you see me. You can see with a wall I've touched when I get up. You know? <laughs> Yeah. Did so, you lose hearing in that ear permanently? Uh, yeah, I lost some of it. Yes, because this this is my good ear. I could I could hear yeah. Because when you talk, you will see me doing this way. When yeah. Thel Selma's sitting on this side, I have to p turn around, put her kiss her so she can talk <laughs> talk into this ear. Yeah, yeah. Are there any other stories that you can remember that you'd like to share? Anything else? Well, well the, no, no, no. Just what I told you about greeting uh, Lieutenant Commander Butch O'Hare when he got off the airplane in uh, Tarawa off the runway and I was You at, told me that off record, why don't you tell uh, me that now? Oh, okay. <laughs> in Tarawa, after about the fourth or fifth day we were on Tarawa, there's, there's some Navy planes that were out doing a job somewhere and they wanted to find a place to land so they were going to land on Tarawa on our, on the runway in Tarawa, which no other planes had been on yet. And uh, the first pl Navy plane came in, uh, Navy pilot drove his plane up, and our gun was right close to the end of the runway. And I, I went over and I talked to this flyer, uh, who I didn't know who he was at that time. And uh, it was, uh, ha happened to be uh, the uh, O'Hare. But your hair. So I welcome, welcome to Tarawa. I said to him just like that. And uh, uh, I, I, he spoke for a minute. Then he had to go somewhere with his re for his report. And uh, unfortunately, the next four planes that tried to land there smashed up. That's you know, they and the rest of them were circling to try to land. They sent them off somewhere else because it was all full of bomb marks, all craters in it. I don't know how the hell O'Hare did it, but he did it. And so the rest of them started, first one, then the other one, and the other one. You know, not serious crack up, but they, they'd land and then they'd run into the rub and they'd flip over and they'd go sideways. But and that that was so they didn't have any planes landed until they uh, fixed the, uh, repaired the runway. Was O'Hare the only one that landed without damaging his plane? Yes, he was the only one. The first one and the only one. Yep, the rest of them did damage. But, yeah. Wow. So that's about the only things I can uh, remember. There's one other time, I pretty near shot a sailor climbing over the fence, but I uh, don't I was on a, a duty at the Naval Ammunition Depot. I was doing gate duty, and uh, it was about one one thirty in the morning. And I heard this rattling over there, and I thought, "Well, I don't know what it was. It was bushes over there. I, I couldn't see it. And it was dark." So I said, "Well, there's something going on out there." So I took out my gun, put a bullet in the chamber, and went over there. And sure enough. I, I, I saw this, this sailor come crawling down. And I stopped a halt. You know, he's still 20 feet away. And I don't know, you know, what, what am I going to do? And uh, he come, I says, oh, what are you doing? He says, uh, are you a, a sailor? And he says, yeah, because, you know, I... They, uh, I just didn't trust him, you know. So I had my gun on him and to come up, and then I found out that he was uh, that he was hit all right with so uh, sailor. But what am I going to do with him? What am I going to? Well, what so, was he doing, crawling around out there? He what? Well, what? Well, he climbed over the fence. Uh -huh. See, he wanted to go on, on liberty. See, they had the the sailors up there who worked in the navy yard, oh, and uh, oh. and they. Uh, and so he went on and went on Liberty, but why he climbed over the fence right next to a guy? Well, I'd say 20, 30 feet from my, from for where I was stationed is uh, is beyond me. And um, because this was a big thing, it probably encircled a oh, couple of square miles, you know, around. There's plenty of fence to climb over. So then I got off duty at. at uh, 
two o'clock or something, and I go and, and I, I write up a little report, and uh, I'm, I'm sleeping. It's about nine o'clock, and, so, and I could hear somebody talking, and the Marine was there. He said, "Oh, don't wake him up. Uh, he just got he just got off duty. He's got to sleep." And they. Um, now that I see there was two sailors there, and uh, he said, no, he said, i got to talk to him now. So he come to me and he said, uh, he says, were you at uh, Sentry Duty last night? He caught the sailor coming in, and he showed, pointed to the guy, and I says, yeah, I was. He said, I appreciate it if you wouldn't report it to him, because the guy would go to jail. And uh, I said, uh, Oh geez, I, I I think I have to. You know, I I didn't know uh, I didn't always trust all these because they're always testing us. And uh, I said, well, no, I, I I don't want to report them either. So he said, well, would would you forget it now? Do do me a favor. He was a, a Navy chief, like he wasn't a commissioned officer, but didn't Navy. Chief. So I said, well, okay, yeah. And so I did. That that ended that and. Uh, but that was another experience. But you know, uh, earlier when when I when I was on gate duty, no, I was not on duty. I was there, but I was on duty. An FBI man come through with a badge. They have badges there with a monkey, a picture of a monkey on it. You know, and 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 the guard didn't. You know, the sentry just let him pass by. So then he was called upon the carpet for letting this FBI go through with a picture. Now, how close do you look at these pictures coming in, you know, and all of that. So this is why I was a little bit leery about this. They were always testing, you know. So that was my other story that I had. I guess that's the end of my stories. Wow. Boy, you no, know. you'll think of more when we turn <laughs> Jack, I'd like to thank you for your service to our country and for giving me this interview. Well, you're uh, certainly welcome. We have... I know you have some artifacts and souvenirs that you brought back that we can look at. You want to show me your knife first? Yeah, this is the knife that I had all the while I was in Tarawa. And this is the knife I was trying to get out to kill the individual that was in the foxhole with me. Fortunately for him, you couldn't get out in time. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> and you also brought back a couple other items. Yeah, I, I brought back this that I picked up on the, when I was there. As you can see, it looks like it's been in the war. And that's a Japanese 31 caliber uh, rifle. It has a spy on it. And then it has a well, I haven't looked at this for a while, but that is supposed to come up, but I guess it won't. Oh, there it is. And there's the sight, and you can see, I don't like to aim it at anybody, so I'm going to aim it over there, but you can see that they could, they could line up for an airplane, put the wings in, and peek through the hole. And a cleaning rod is at the end. And that's it. You want that's to show us the bullet you used for the American gun? Oh, yes. And this is for the M M1 rifle that I used. Eight, eight bullets in a clip. Is that the M1 front? carabine or no? No, no. This, this, this is just an M1 rifle. Yeah, that. this is not the carabine, no. This is my own M1 rifle. Garage rifle. And that's yep, they, these were with me all the time. I just saved them as a souvenir. And then I still have my dog tags left. Do you want to explain how little dog tags are set up? Yep, you put them around your neck. You showed me about the cut. Yeah, and one, uh, one is going to permanently be on here, but the other one is kind of hung down, as you can see, or after. You're dead. They come and they just clip it right off and take this with them and then they leave this 
with the dead marine. Very convenient, huh? Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. And this is a a necklace, a native necklace from the islands. Which that islands? Did that come to Tarawa? Tarawa, yes. Mm -hmm. And you sent that home? To my mother. Yes, I sent that home to my mother when I got a chance. And I'm going to take a picture uh, to include with this record of Jack's medals and ribbons. Okay. Do it, Jack. You're welcome. <laughs>